Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, we meet another candidate for New York Attorney General. Plus, the 14th Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival is upon us. We'll talk to its founder. Welcome to the show. I'm Ashley Ford, joined in the studio by producer Ross Tuttle. Hello, Ross. Hello, Ashley. Are you going to talk to me about hot dogs again? <laughs> gotta. We gotta, we gotta let our audience know what happened, right. Ashley. Right. Let's well, do it. no surprises on the women's front. The Mickey Sudo, she won again. I think it's mm -hmm. four years running. Uh, Joey Chestnut set another world record. Mm -hmm. After a brief miscount, they originally thought he'd only consumed 64 weenies. Then they x-rayed his colon and saw that there were actually 74 in there. Uh, and DA Eric Gonzalez was on hand to confirm the results. Oh. Believe it or not. Oh. Do you wish you were there? I don't. I don't wish I was there okay. watching somebody eat how many? I don't know how many pounds that would be. Like 74 hot dogs? How many pounds? That'd be like, I don't know. I don't. It's like, uh, we don't Sorry. have to talk about hot dogs anymore. Let's not talk about it anymore. More serious matters. Yeah, let's talk about serious stuff. Um, so last month it was uh, Pablo Villavicencio who was picked up at, um, by ICE at Fort Hamilton when he went to deliver some pasta and pizza. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think he's still in immigration detention. Uh, on July 4th, an elderly Brooklyn couple went up to Fort Drum in upstate to visit their son-in-law, who is a sergeant, mm -hmm. uh, has served two tours in Afghanistan. When they handed his IDMYC to them, they said, not sufficient. What else you got? And they said, well, we've got this. And they said, well, how'd you get in the country? They said, well, we were unauthorized when we came in. But we're here, we've got work permits, they said, uh, and Border Patrol, which was actually probably not very far away because the border with Canada, it's very close by, came, picked him up, took him to Buffalo, now they're in immigration detention. You heard about this, I'm I assuming. did hear about this. I think what a glaring look at the hypocrisy of this country right now to have a president who has been screaming for months about NFL members who kneel <laughs> because it is supposedly disrespectful to the troops. Mm. And you just took away one of your sergeants who has served two tours in Afghanistan's in-laws. You took them away. Like, that is another one of those things that tells you that the Law and Order Administration um, isn't really so much about law and order as much as they are about ethnic cleansing. <laughs> yeah, you, you said it right. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is. It's just, it just you know, there's no escaping it at this no. point. There really isn't any escaping it. Nope. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, there was one other thing uh, um, that we were going to talk about. Oh, the... Um, so what Cuomo is doing with the Democrats in the Senate, and they're trying to push a bill, uh, the Reproductive Health Act, which mm -hmm. they will, which they hope it will make sure that the provisions of Roe v. Wade are codified in the state in right. anticipation of, you know, the right um, shift of the Supreme Court, which mm -hmm. in anticipation it'll have happened by the time most people see this show. Um, but we'll see what happens on that front. But you we know, won't. states are really being forced to figure out how we can protect ourselves from our federal government. Mm -hmm. um, some real, real federalist stuff going on, not in the way that I think people anticipated. Absolutely, it's not in the way people anticipated. <laughs> but you know, I've always been the person who thought that people aren't going to come in through the front door. You know what I mean? To rob you <laughs> of your possessions or your rights. Mm -hmm. They will find a sneakier way in. Um, or they'll convince you to open the front door, but they can only do that, in my opinion, if they kind of brainwash you a little first. You know? That's already happening yeah. out there in the world. Um, coming up, candidate for New York Attorney General, Leisha Eve. Don't go away. The New York Attorney General's office has a national profile these days, not only because the former AG resigned over some pretty shocking sexual abuse allegations, but also because a lot of people have put their hope in the office, that it will prosecute under state law anyone Trump pardons after federal convictions in relation to the Russia probe. There are also the multiple attorney general lawsuits against the federal government, having to do with the environment, the census, immigration, and more. 
along with the issues an AG normally has to deal with, all this makes the job that much more important and the race for it that much more intense. Today, we meet another one of the four announced candidates for the position. Her name is Leisha Eve. Welcome to 112BK, Leisha. Well, it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Ashley, for having me. It is so, so, so good to have somebody on who can talk to us about what attorney generals actually do. I think a lot of people think they know, <laughs> but they don't actually know. What do you think the title and the role really means? Well, I'm glad you started with that question because now more than ever, the office of New York State Attorney General is extraordinarily important. Mm -hmm. Because of the breadth, because of the powers of the office, I mean, this office is more important than it has been in my lifetime, and right. I'll be 54 years of age next month. It's extraordinarily important because now more than ever, and you talked about it in your opening, we have a president right now, President Trump, who is seeking to undermine all the rights mm. that so many of our predecessors fought so hard to achieve mm -hmm. and to undermine so much of the values. He's trying to undermine so many of the values that New Yorkers in particular have been national leaders on and that we hold dear. This office, in my humble opinion, is second only to Bob Mueller mm. in holding the President of the United States accountable. So the office is extraordinarily important for a number of reasons that have been discussed. I mean, the Office of Attorney General, the Attorney General, and I'm working very hard to be that person, to be that woman on January 1, mm -hmm. can hold the president accountable. There are also a vast array of powers that the Office of Attorney General has to hold bad actors in the state accountable. We've got mm -hmm. a bad actor in Washington, but we've got a bad actors in the state of New York as well. Oh, yes, we do. And so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and there are extraordinary powers that the office has to exercise, and I'm running because I believe I am best prepared, most qualified to exercise that power uh, for the good of New Yorkers across the state. Can you tell me, what do you see as some of the most important cases the office is pursuing right now? Well, there are so many, but I would say they really fall into two or three different buckets. One mm -hmm. is protecting the civil rights that have been advanced for women, for LGBTQ, mm -hmm. uh, protecting the advancements we've made in environmental rights, mm -hmm. protecting the advancements we've made in making our criminal justice system better. It is not fair. It does treat black and brown differently. It does treat the poor differently. Mm -hmm. And it treats most, uh, worst of all, black and brown young men. Mm -hmm. And so there is so much work to be done nationally in New York State. But there was some progress made, and this president is seeking to roll that progress back and to undermine it. And so, so many of the lawsuits focus on immigrant rights, mm -hmm. protection of environmental rights, protecting women's reproductive rights. Who would have thought that we are now in a position where Roe v. Wade could be overturned? Mm -hmm. That's a very real possibility. And as attorney general, I will spend every moment possible ensuring that those rights, the most fundamental right to control our bodies, mm -hmm. is protected to the fullest extent of the law. Even mm -hmm. if it's not protected anywhere in the United States of America, it will be fully protected in New York State. You mentioned in a recent interview, actually, with the New York Times, that you're a proud woman of color who is the best person to be attorney general. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. Why are you the best person to be attorney general? Well, for a number of reasons. This office, um, as I mentioned, has extraordinary powers and opportunities to do good, mm -hmm. to make the state better. A little bit about my background. Um, product of the Buffalo Public Schools. Mm -hmm. uh, graduated from Smith College and Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School of Government. My first job out of law school was clerking for the first black man to serve a full term on the state's highest court, the New York State Court of Appeals. Actually, that was the first time I was living in Brooklyn. I lived on the top floor of a four-floor walk-up, mm -hmm. 140 Amity Street, and my roommate at the time was a wonderful woman, is a wonderful woman, while I was clerking for Fritz Alexander, mm -hmm. the first black man to be appointed to a full term on the state's highest court, she was working, clerking for Judge Connie Baker Motley. Wow. And here you had two African-American women living together, two clerking for two black judges, one in the state's highest court and the extraordinary Constance uh, Baker Motley. Wow. Um, so, but the, 
For the first two years in my legal career, I had discussions with the state's highest court, the judges mm -hmm. on that court, about the most fundamental issues of our time, based mm -hmm. upon state la statutes, state constitution, federal constitution. I'm a litigator by training, litigated in Washington, litigated in courtrooms, both state and federal, across the state. Had the honor of serving as counsel to Joe Biden in the mid-1990s, focused on Immigration and Violence Against Women Act, which he authored, um, and more recently counsel to Senator Clinton fighting us alongside her on so many issues mm -hmm. of concern uh, on social justice, and then more recently as the chief economic development advisor to Governor Cuomo, the first woman, the first person of color in the state's history to oversee 11 agencies in state government. So I believe my unique collection of experiences mm -hmm. from the state's highest court, as a litigator in Washington and in New York, working for two extraordinary Americans, Hillary and Joe Biden, mm -hmm. and then my more recent experience um, understanding all the needs of the state, mm -hmm. from the wonderful borough of Brooklyn, across the city, across the region, to my hometown of Buffalo. All those experiences, I believe, collect collectively prepare me the best to continue the fight mm -hmm. and best prepare me to deal with the challenges yet to come. You know, that from Buffalo to Brooklyn, I'll fight for the rights of all New Yorkers and defend the natural resources of our great state is on your website. Yes, it is. Can you tell me, how will the AG work with Brooklyn leaders specifically to work for Brooklynites? Well, one of the critical things that I believe the Office of Attorney General can do better. Mm -hmm. Now, you referred to the former attorney general, mm -hmm. disgraced, uh, you know, hopefully he will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law mm -hmm. for phys allegedly physically assaulting mm -hmm. women. But the office did great work, and the office continues to do great work under mm -hmm. the current attorney general and the hundreds of extraordinary lawyers who work for the office of attorney general. But one of the things that I believe that the office can do more, and I certainly would champion as attorney general, is to engage in more outreach mm. across the borough, mm -hmm. across the city, but particularly in Brooklyn, on a range of issues. Housing, mm. right? Yes. Housing, probably first and foremost. Yes. Not only housing discrimination, but educating Brooklynites who may be in a, in, a, in a situation where they can purchase their homes, but they don't fully understand what their rights right. Right, are to, uh, so in are terms you, of being able to do that. I think there's a lot more outreach that can be done on housing rights, immigration, Violence Against Women Act absolutely. for low-wage workers, so that when individuals are confronted with a situation, they have a better understanding of what their rights are. Because the attorney general can go after and sue someone, but you right. want to arm people with the knowledge and the power Absolutely. so that you don't have to be reactive. They can be proactive with the office of attorney general standing right Absolutely. beside them. And those are resources that people really need. I can't yes. tell you how often someone on this show is talking about the need for more attention to be paid to affordable housing in Brooklyn right now. So, and there's so, mi there's yes. so many wonderful organizations right here yes. in Brooklyn that do extraordinary work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's never going to be on the front page of a newspaper, right. but it is critically important work. It's foundational. And one of the things that I would do, without mm -hmm. question, as the Attorney General, and I hope that I will be, and I will work very hard to earn the support of Brooklynites to be their Attorney General on January 1. One of the things I will do will, will be to partner with those organizations to mm -hmm. give them a greater platform, to give them a greater opportunity to expand their extraordinary works mm -hmm. uh, to help more Brooklynites across, across the borough. That would be fantastic. Um, there was an article in a local paper that titled Different People Running Different Things. They mm -hmm. called one person the landlord challenger, another person the progressive fighter. There was the GOP underdog. They called you the political insider. So I'm wondering, why do you think that would be the characterization you received, and how do you receive it? Well, first of all, I'm surprised by it, because I am not the endorsed candidate. Right. I am not the endorsed candidate of the party. I mean, listen, I'm a proud Democrat mm -hmm. uh, and have proudly worked for Democrats and, and serving people of this state and, frankly, this nation, regardless of party affiliation. But I'm not the endorsed candidate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the governor didn't endorse me. Uh, he endorsed one of my opponents, 
Um, and, you know, people have asked me about that, and I've said, you know what, each person has a right to make their own decision. Mm -hmm. I'm reaching out to millions of voters across the state, right. and their vote is the one that's going to matter on September 13th. Mm. Uh, I am going to be on the ballot, not because a couple of hundred people in a room made a decision, mm -hmm. but because thousands of New Yorkers in this borough and across the state have taken the time to learn about my uh, learn about my campaign, learn about the kind of attorney general I would be, and they made a decision to write their name and address on a dotted line to right. guarantee that I would be on the ballot. So um, I believe that the the name that one journalist in one newspaper right. uh, gave me is not an apt description. It's mm -hmm. inconsistent with the facts. Right. Um, I have my entire life been an independent person. Mm -hmm. um, any person that knows me well can attest to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm my own person, but I'm also the daughter of two extraordinary public servants right. who are fighters, who are independent thinkers. And I'm my own person, but in that sense, the apple falls directly below the tree. When I was seven, and some of your viewers who were too young may not know, but some of your older viewers remember the Attica riots mm. in 71. And when my father, Arthur Reeve, was serving in the state assembly at the time, he was one of a number of individuals that the inmates at Attica asked to come and negotiate on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fully understand at age seven what was going on. But in later years, I learned my father made a decision to go into that prison not knowing whether he would come out. Wow. So I tell people that's what I'm made of. Yeah. So insider, not a good description uh, that does not reflect who I am. Uh, your I am a person. fighter, I'm an independent thinker, and if I am fortunate to be the Attorney General on January 1, there will be no stronger advocate for people in this borough and for the people in this city and for people in this state than I. Alicia, thank you so much. Thank you so much for show. having me again, Ashley. It's, it's really been a pleasure and this honor. This was fantastic. We'll talk again, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a conversation about 2018 Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival. But first, a recap from 2017's installment. This is a journey into sound. <laughs> Don't sweat the technique. One borough of the city lays claim to being the birthplace of hip-hop. Okay, it's the Bronx, an apartment complex at 1520 Cedric Avenue, to be precise. But Brooklyn can be considered its incubator, what with Talib Kweli, KRS-One, Lil' Kim, Biggie, Yazin Bey, a.k.a. Most Def, Jam Master J, Joey Badass, ODB, and Jay-Z, to name only some. That's why it's fitting that the city's biggest, oldest, pretty much only hip-hop festival happens right here. To tell us about the 14th installment, which is already underway, we're joined by its founder, Wes Jackson. Thanks for joining us on 112BK, Wes. Thanks for having me. So, Wes, just start, we listed a few names of hip-hop royalty who have hailed from Brooklyn, obviously. Why do you think Brooklyn is the epicenter for hip-hop? I think Brooklyn is the epicenter because I think with the ex Manhattan is just is just too I don't it's know too. it's too much it's too it's much, too much. <laughs> yeah so a lot of at least when I came back from uh, when I came back from college you know twenty some odd years ago all that creative energy was coming across the bridge and I think mm -hmm. it just settled here for Green you know you had the Spike Lee movies mm -hmm. you know who just created this whole mystery of the borough and attracted. All of this energy, all these resources, and then it planted the seeds that became, you know, Kwali, Yasin. Right. And so I think it's just it's just where the it's where the energy of the city is right now. Maybe the money's over there, but the energy's here. Why did that happen? Well, I mean, well, here's what I'm trying to understand, especially in this context. How and why do you separate the money from the energy? How did right. the energy end up right here? Well, if you ask me, I think that art and commerce are always, they, they need each other, but they're always gonna come to a conflict. Mm -hmm. And sort of the commerce, I think, of Manhattan just made the art not feel welcome. Right. So it came, you know, over here, and obviously there's some money around here, but I think with sort of the middle class neighborhoods, the, you know, you have the gentrified, you have the old West Indian, you have the old Southern black, you got oh, Italian, yeah. it just, we had that 
pocket where you could have all these different people with different influences right. come together, not get smashed together like mm -hmm. in Manhattan, but naturally come together at, you know, a local school, you know, PS11 or Brooklyn Tech. Right. Uh, and I think it just, it just became, it's just really fertile soil. Yes. Uh, for, for lack of a better. Yes, and these seeds got planted and we see the fruit now, we yep. absolutely do. Now, what inspired you to start the festival 14 years ago? And were you surprised that something like it didn't already exist? Huh. Yes, so to answer the first question, the inspiration was New Orleans Jazz Fest. Mm. In 2004, me and my wife and my partner, Ebony, went down there with some friends of ours and just had the best time of our lives. We didn't have any kids by then. So yeah. It was like, <laughs> right. you know, there was drinking and eating and all this other stuff that it's we can't do kind now. Of fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and as soon as I was there, I said, why is there not something like this in Brooklyn mm -hmm. for hip hop? That simple. And it was just like, yeah, we should do that. And then, you know, in just one of those moments of the light bulb, I just said, you know what? Let's create a Brooklyn hip hop festival. And the funny thing is, this was never supposed to be the name. That was always the working title right. of this idea. And people just said, it's just so simple, it's straightforward. Right. So we are trying to do what Jazz Fest does for New Orleans, what it does for the culture of jazz, the mm -hmm. people, the food. We're trying to do that you know, here. And now as Essence Fest just wrapped up, oh, yeah. we want to have something like that for hip hop, where it's like mm -hmm. this just homecoming of positive vibes and energies and, you know, girls trips and boys trips. And oh, yeah. uh, so th th it's really a lot of New Orleans I'm trying to, to replicate. I love here. that. I love uh, that. And over the years, you know, have you guys watched any acts really launch from the festival? Yeah. Um, a lot. Uh, I'm yeah. proud to say in 2011, we had Kendrick Lamar. Oh. Um, this was bef before, he put out his last mixtape before his first big album. Mm -hmm. So he was still a bit of a, like a cult phenomenon, this kid oh, from yeah. Compton. Even I was like, why are y'all so excited about this, you know, this, this short guy from Compton? Right. <laughs> and then I look back like, oh, yeah, now I get now it. I get it. Okay. But uh, we had Lupe Fiasco from Chicago. Uh, we've had uh, Currency. So we've had a lot of these young, we, we always try to pair like what we call young lions mm -hmm. that are on the way up and we pair them with a legend. Yes. So the year we had Kendrick Lamar, we also had Q-Tip from A Tribe Called Quest. Wow. And people forget that because Q-Tip brought out Kanye. Wow. So in one year you had Kendrick, Black Thought, Busta Rhymes, Kanye West, and Q-Tip in just in a few hours. So we, we do pride ourselves on that. We have tons of new acts. Even, even this year, I'm super excited about some of the Tell new Tell me acts. about some of the headliners that you're really excited about, right. or some of those up-and-comers, like what's going on? Well, we're, well, to start, I guess, from the top, we're, we're having a reunion of Black Star, which is mm. Yasin Bey, mm -hmm. formerly known as Most Def and Taleb Kweli. 20 years ago, the Black Star album came out, which for me, for somebody in my generation, just kind of changed the way we looked at hip hop. Mm -hmm. The That was the time when Jay-Z was on one side, Jay-Z and Biggie were on one sort of side of Brooklyn, mm -hmm. bringing Brooklyn to its renaissance. And then you had Yasin and Kwali on another side, a more conscious side, whatever you, you want to call it, and they all just kind of exploded at right. the same time. I was a little bit more on that side, not that I didn't like, I don't like Jay and Big, but um, that's just where you felt. That's where I felt. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's where I was when I was just coming back from college. So to have them for the first time in Brooklyn since 2004. Wow. Uh, this is going to be a big moment for hip-hop. It's going to be a, a good moment for the younger generation. Mm -hmm. uh, they're joined by Farrell Monch, uh, who's from or, uh, Organized Confusion, who I think mm -hmm. is one of the best MCs ever. That right. Biggie actually said when, he, when Biggie was at his height, he said the best MC around was Farrell Monch. Wow. So it's it's a little bit of that culture. But then we on the young side, we have uh, Latasha, who's a young young woman from Flatbush, mm -hmm. who's doing some amazing stuff. We're bringing a brother named Collaborate from L.A. So we're, we're, we're continuing to make Brooklyn this international destination, plus Sky Zoo, who lives right around the corner from right. me. I think he's been here a bunch of times. <laughs> yes. Torre, Uncle Ralph is our host. So wow. it's a mashing together of all these uh, generations. This sounds amazing. Um, the festival's promotional material says conference and festival. Talk to me about the conference part. Yes, I'm glad you said that. We're super excited about that. We've This is our third year in a row. We're at Medgar Evers College over mm -hmm. in Crown Heights having what we call the Hip Hop Institute. Mm -hmm. So the first three days, starting tomorrow, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, is 
is our conference, where we try to have some professional development, have some thought leaders, and actually sit, not party, not, not drinking, we're, not, we're just sitting around building with great minds about how we can push the culture forward. That. So we have April Rain, who's the founder of the Oscar So White. April's gonna be She's here. She's our keynote tomorrow morning. You should I come know April. Her. Yes, come, That's come. Gonna, I should. If you're not working, of course. I should. But uh, yeah, so April's coming to be our keynote. We wow. have um, another brother named Cam, Cameron McCullough, who's the founder of Duce Palooza, which is kind of like the younger version of what we do. I, I look at Cam as kind of like a better version of me doing, mm -hmm. taking what we've uh, started to, to new heights. So we just, these are just really the leaders in, you know, in the industry. So we talk not only about hip hop, but we're talking about, you know, uh, issues of empowerment, uh, representation. you know, representation, right. All of these all things of that, that hip hop needs to take the lead on. That has been, oh, and hip hop has the room to take the lead yes. on, to be perfectly honest. Can you tell me what are the particulars about tickets, venues? How do we show up? So support? you can go to bkhiphopfest.com and that has all the ticket information. You can follow us on all social media at BK Hip Hop Fest. That will sort of point you into all the directions. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Hip Hop Institute is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You can buy a pass, I think, for $10 to get you in all three days. Mm -hmm. It's from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, then in the evening we have, we're going to be at the Brooklyn Historical Society on Wednesday with Angela Yee from The Breakfast Club. Wow. Then I'm going to actually be interviewing her, which I'm super excited. So we have sort of daytime programming, and then we have the kind of people who have nine to fives. We have evening right. programming. Uh, on Wednesday and then Thursday we're going to have Get Paid to Be Yourself with Julian Mitchell. And then every evening starting tonight at Beer Wax, right down the block, yeah. we're having what we call BHF at night. So we're having a special DJ to come in every night where you come and grab a beer, just cool out. So we're, we have, it's, it's sort of, it takes you all over. Friday we have the Juice Hip Hop exhibition, right. which is really our foray into the young generation. There's mm -hmm. dancers, uh, DJs, MCs. It's, it's, it's a great snapshot of where the culture is going to be. And then on Saturday, we're going to be down at uh, Dumbo, Brooklyn Bridge Plaza, which is right underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, mm -hmm. and in St. Anne's Warehouse. That's kind of like the big day. That's so we have family day. Fantastic. We have the big conference. We have family day. We got a beer garden. We got a spades tournament going on. Oh, man. Video game and lounge. It's going to be a blast. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, whew, y'all out here. Because <laughs> yes, all of that sounds like the barbecue yes. happening at one time. And so I'm definitely here. For Excellent. Thank you for coming on. No, Thank no. For thanks for having me. That's the show for today. Tomorrow, Jarrett Murphy will meet with another young female candidate trying to shake up the local political scene, this time in Brooklyn. Julia Salazar is running as a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, gunning for a New York State Senate seat. Hope you can join us. Mm -hmm.